Hi, everyone. Welcome. So we expected three microphones. We only have two. So please excuse as Mars and I awkwardly hand microphones between each other for this talk. Uh, we didn't expect to have to do that. So apologies in advance. Welcome to Entity Component Systems and you. They're not just for games anymore. So if anyone gets the, the reference to they're not just for games anymore, please come and see us at the end. We'd like to be your friend. It's slightly there, obscure. There is no prize. There is no prize. Uh, well, friendship. Yeah, it's true. Friendship. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Paris. This is Tim. This is Mars. Mars is a proper serious software developer, uh, a research assistant, and an upcoming author on an O'Reilly book on AI for Swift. She's a real serious business person who does serious software for serious causes and serious reasons. Uh, Tim and I are game developers. Uh, we spend most of our time doing video games, uh, tools for video games, video game techniques, video game teaching, and other frivolous shit. Uh, so things, frivolous things, things. Frivolous things. But we, we kind of know what we're doing in the video game world, and Mars very much knows what she's doing in the serious, actual software world. We are from a tiny, relatively unknown island at the bottom of Australia called Tasmania. So that may explain to you why we might seem like we have strange accents sometimes. Uh, mate. Mate. <laughs> we really apologize in advance. Uh, there's a lot of Tasmanians at O'Reilly conferences these days. Ooh, I skipped. Uh, we do lots and lots of things, ranging from video games to conferences like this, to books, to tools for video games, all sorts of stuff. And we feel like we kind of straddle a whole bunch of disciplines. So we like to make our talks interdisciplinary when we can. Uh, we build software ranging from stuff for other people to stuff for giant companies to stuff for ourselves to video games for enormous uh, platforms like the PlayStation 4 and uh, tiny little things that nobody ever sees. So we, we really touch a lot of different things. Now, this is just kind of a, a sampling of the random stuff that we find ourselves doing. Uh, Tim and I have written something like 20 O'Reilly books and Mars is working on her first one. Uh, we do all sorts of stuff. So. Um, so what we're here to talk about today is ECS, or more technically, in this case, the Entity Component System uh, Framework or Paradigm. Uh, we're just going to call it ECS for the rest of us, so I'm sorry if ECS is already something else in your head, maybe elastic, you know, et cetera. Sorry about that. Um, it's just we're not going to waste all them syllables. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what ECS is, how games uh, have been using it and are currently using it. Uh, and hopefully how you might want to think about using it. Now, nothing that we're going to present here is particularly new. A lot of these principles uh, exist across various different sort of architectures and sort of frameworks. Uh, we're not here to reinvent the wheel. You may know some of this stuff under different terminology. Our main goal is we hope you kind of leave this going, hmm, that you know, small slice is a neat idea. Maybe I should consider sort of that. Or the exact opposite in that you, you know, want to come and be like, you're completely wrong, you idiot. You know nothing about software architecture. We'd also be very happy with that, because at least then you're thinking and discussing it. As a disclaimer, if you Google ECS, you probably aren't going to get entity component systems at the moment. Or if you do, it'll be about the Unity game engine. We're hoping to change that beginning with this talk. But it is typically associated with games, and it's also a very overloaded acronym. So we do want to reinforce that this is not really a games talk. We are games people and software people, and we're kind of talking about both things. But because this is a games-centric uh, architecture that has kind of come out of games, and the way we see it is it has come out of games, we will be using games for almost all of our examples. Uh, we're really sorry about that. If we could think of a better way of doing it, we would, but we're not that clever. Uh, so not really a games talk, but most, if not all, of our examples are going to be game-based. Just a heads up. So before we get started, I'm just curious, has anyone here touched ECS already? Like one per okay. So you can leave, because yeah. you'll know our lies are lies. But uh, <laughs> anyone actually making games? Anyone in game development? Hey, okay, same guy. same guy. That's good. That bodes well. <laughs> so there's one of Surprise. you. Surprise. That's, that's really, this is really good. So we weren't expecting this talk to get accepted at the very serious software architecture conference, because we didn't really think anyone would be interested. But we're really we're gratified you're here. Uh, we assume most of you, judging from the, the steely stares at me, are working on very serious business software and have no time for video games. So if you'd like to know what a video game is, we can tell you about that later. Uh, you can Google it. <laughs> that one is that one is Googleable. But no, we, we we just yeah. I'm curious to see if anyone is in games. It's it's interesting to see the cross section of people here. So don't judge us. For a quick roadmap of what we're going to look at, we're going to begin with. Uh, a pretty high level look at what ECS is and then going into a history lesson and the, the motivators that made it come about. Uh, we're going to talk about some suggested implementation details, 
not perfect and not the only way. We're going to talk about some of the more technical things that ECS could be good for and not good for in non-game software. And then we're going to summarize and give a bunch of resources. So let's get started with a, a bit of a look through what ECS actually is. And I just want to point out, feel free to tweet at us during the presentation. Our Twitter handles are on the corner down there. And because there's three of us, it means we can reply while we're talking, in theory. Uh, sometimes people take us up on that offer. So feel free to. So as the brighter sparks amongst you might have figured out, ECS is entity component systems. And to figure out what that actually means in practice, we need to look at a short answer and a long answer. And because you know I'm lazy, I will start with the short answer. Uh, the short answer is that ECS is a, is a paradigm or an architecture. This is the software architecture conference, not the software paradigm conference, but it's kind of an architecture and a paradigm in one for writing and organizing code. Uh, it really likes a strict separation between data and logic. So if you're familiar with very strict, sensible textbook object-oriented programming terminology, it has a lack of encapsulation. Uh, it emphasizes the prominent role of composition in modeling data. So that's the short answer. The long answer is that ECS is an architecture that video games absolutely love. Uh, video games, simulations, things like that. Uh, it encourages a really strict separation between the data and the logic. So it kind of makes sense the way video games work. And we'll cover that as we explain how this works. Uh, you compose objects uh, to model data rather than through inheritance or polymorphism or other OOP features. Now, it might sound like we're kind of bashing OOP throughout this talk, and we're not really, because we know OOP is, as like a textbook definition isn't really a thing, but it's an easy way to sort of frame how ECS is different. Um, OK, so realistically, why does ECS exist? Uh, as with all frameworks, it's because it tries and solves some sort of problem. And it sort of came about uh, games are weird. Games, from a programming perspective, not from like an entertainment value perspective, actually only care about two things. That's performance and flexibility. So performance is sort of the first one. Realistically, the current sort of uh, industry standard for games is 60 frames a second. That means everything, literally everything you have to do, has to happen in 16.6666666 milliseconds. If you take more than that, it's going to stutter, it's going to look bad, you're going to get terrible reviews on Steam, you're going to make no money, you're going to find yourself out of a job, and you know that's not good. If you think your audience for like actual serious software is bad, try building a game. Yeah, you have no idea. Um, so there are some tricks you can do to get around this 16.6 milliseconds, but as a rule of thumb, you've got a very, very short amount of time to do literally everything you need to do every single frame. Uh, the next thing is flexibility. So video games are basically jillions of little tiny pieces uh, that are all combining into one amazing thing which we call game. Uh, managing this can get out of hand very, very quickly. Games are also made by uh, relatively large teams compared to most software development. Uh, games will have hundreds of people working on them, and some very large projects do, but like large teams are the norm for games, whereas uh, in general, software development tends to try and keep small teams, in my experience. Uh, so not only are there a lot of moving code and asset pieces, there's a lot of moving people pieces. So it all gets out of hand. Now, ECS encourages both of these. It encourages both performance and flexibility. Uh, now, we really want to stress the keyword here is being encouraged because uh, ECS, I don't want to say it's easy to mess up, um, but it is still possible to mess up because uh, it is a little bit different than how most architectures sort of work. So it comes like with a fresh, whoa, a fresh set of foot guns that you've never perhaps seen before that you're like, oh, I could try this. Um, so yeah, it, it does have some risks associated with it. It's easy to make mistakes. So that's great, you say, but your software architects and your architectures are probably already performant and scalable and everything is fine. So why should you care? Well, let's go to this very simple game example. Let's say you have a base type enemy and then you have a sword enemy and you have a shield enemy. But things don't always stay the same. I would like an enemy with a sword and a shield. So where do you put that guy? <laughs> uh, and that's a bit contrived, but in games, we have a tendency for this to get very messy fast because there are two ways that you can try to combat this. You either try to maintain reasonable inheritance relationships and remember where all your different attributes and behaviors are without duplicating your logic all over the place, or you make these really powerful, all-encompassing base objects and then try to mute a bunch of their stuff as you go down. And this also gets out of hand very quickly. Um, so this here is, uh, this is from Catherine West's excellent RustConf closing keynote about game development and Rust. 
Uh, this is just a sped up excerpt of uh, the accessor file for their player class in their game Starbound. And it's massive. This is just the accessors. There's no logic here. This is all just the interface into it. And this sort of shows how easy it is to make these giant god objects really trivially in games because the functionality that uh, anything may have is effectively determined on the fly by what the players are going to do. Now, it does sound like we're bagging out uh, Starbound and Catherine West. We're not. It's an amazing game. They're amazing developers. Uh, it's just this thing naturally happens in games because of the nature of games. You're constantly being told to add in new features, and you're a programmer. In this case, you're going to be lazy and just stick it all in one big file. It doesn't look like this because they're bad. It looks like this because programming doesn't really work the way games do. So to give some context to how these sort of problems with video games being basically awful to build gave rise to things like ECS, we're going to have a really quick history lesson. We're going to go way, way back in ancient, deepest, darkest history to the long distant past, which is the Game Developers Conference, the GDC, in the distant time of 2002. So in 2002 at the GDC, uh, a talk was given from the developers of an RPG called Dungeon Siege. Has anyone played Dungeon Siege? It was, hey! a, so it was, a, it was ahead of its time in a lot of ways because it had a really flexible, complicated system uh, in the game. And Dungeon Siege used what they called an entity system, which is probably something you've heard of or touched or used. Uh, it made it easier to create entities in pieces and allow the designers to modify the game objects. So one of the really groundbreaking things about Dungeon Siege was the game was built by designers more than most other games were because it allowed designers to build entities in the game without having to code stuff as much. Uh, and it made them easy to understand. Uh, it made trying out new game design ideas much easier because it kind of cross-cut traditional object-oriented programming ideas. Uh, they were very agile, they were very fast. It was a very successful project in terms of the game design. Now, a little bit later, much more recently, in 2007, the development team behind Operation Flashpoint Dragon Rising. Dragon which, Rising. Thank you, Tim. Uh, which is a sequel to a very successful game, started using an entity system inspired by the work of Dungeon Siege. Uh, and one of those developers, Adam Martin, wrote up his thoughts on their architecture on his blog. And he still blogs today. He's a very interesting guy to follow. Uh, but in doing so, he popularized the terminology and concepts that are central to the way we talk about ECS in the video game world now. Uh, so he kind of created the jargon that we use now to talk about this subject. So blame him for the namespace collisions. Right. Um, so the sort of the core things, the, the three main things, I guess, terminology that uh, he came up with were entities, components, and systems. Entities at their core just have IDs. That's all they are. They're an ID. Uh, components have the data that are necessary for other things and systems have the logic. Uh, so one of the kind of interesting things is uh, there's this very clean separation between all three, and systems are sort of first, uh, first class elements as much as the components and the entities themselves, which is a little bit different from most things we sort of get at. So let's look at these one by one. We'll start with entity. An entity is any object in your game. It might be a projectile, a player, an enemy, anything. Uh, it's just a unique identifier. No logic attached. It's just an ID that allows a collection of components to be associated with it somehow, as you'll see later. It's the potato of the Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> uh, it's a bit hard to describe because I, I, for one, always go to say the object, and that's a very loaded term. So there are s different ways that you can describe them, anything but the terrain, but you, Sometimes you also could the make terrain. the terrain if you really want to make it hard. Uh, somebody proposed the term assemblages. Anything works. The potato. Uh, but entities are boring because they're just a thing to reference. In many impl implementations, it's just an integer, which, hang on, isn't this just a primary key? Well, yeah, yes it is. And that'll probably make more sense as we go along. But we get to the components. Uh, a component has some data that is needed f to support a behavior or a feature. Uh, it's basically a flag. For example, a bullet pro projectile might need some position information in order to be drawn on screen or to know if it will hit something. In many implementations, a component is just a struct, a class, an array, a dictionary. Uh, the flag definition comes into play when it's none of those things at all, such as there might be a playable component that just indicates whether a character entity can be player controlled that acts as a Boolean about whether a certain entity has that component or not, and it holds nothing. Then we get to the system, which is the interesting bit. It's where the logic of a behavior lives. Each one operates on the components relevant to it. For example, a movement system might iterate over all the entities that have both a position component and a velocity component. The system would modify the position based on its velocity. 
I do just want to add, when I was talking about this to some people, they said, ah, microservices, and then we got a huge debate. If you want to think of them as microservices, you can personally. I don't think they're the same, but we can have that debate after the uh, talk. So as, as this slide kind of alludes to, there's a lot of crossover terminology, and a lot of these concepts come from other places and have been used in other places before and after this. So we're not trying to say ECS is the one true way of doing things. It's just one way we've done things in games, and it might be helpful to you to learn how we're doing that to solve similar problems outside of games. On that note, you'll see a lot of stuff on the internet if you do Google around for entity component architecture, which is even more confusingly sometimes called an entity component system as opposed to entity component systems, which is actually two different things. Uh, but on the surface, it sounds similar. EC has entities and components, but contrary to ECS, components in EC often have logic. Uh, EC, in a, like a hardcore dictionary definition sense, is really just a layer on top of object-oriented programming where you're using encapsulation, inheritance, polymorphism, and so on to compose objects, whereas a dictionary hardcore strict definition of ECS is you're ignoring traditional object-oriented programming principles and composing entities outside of that sort of system. So don't be confused, don't be alarmed. You don't have to be rigid about these things. You can just take all the bits that you like and apply them in however you, you want to. Um, so uh, what's happening with ECS uh, today? So who's using it? Well, I mean, there's games. Um, and that's currently about it. Uh, we have found a few other examples, um, but you know, you're, you're not in games. So let's unpack it a little bit more. We're not going to talk about games anymore. Uh, so why would it be useful to you? So to do this, we're going to talk about games. Um, sorry about that. Again, most of the examples are going to be game specific. You, you laugh, but we actually are really sorry. We sat there sort of crying over the last few weeks trying to prepare this talk to remove the game stuff, and then we just basically arrived. We have to talk about games to explain this properly. Uh, so the first thing is sort of uh, games today are extremely dynamic. Uh, there are lots and lots of moving parts. So game worlds are built out of all of these entities, these things, these Mr. Potato Heads minus the, the bits, uh, many of which are unique. Uh, they have all these different properties. So a tree is going to be different from a human, which is going to be different from an alien, which is going to be different from a car, which is going to be different from a whatever. All of these things have to interact in this massive, complex world, all of which are unique, uh, which means it's get, it gets complex fast. To make matters worse, games are in constant development flux. Right up until when they're released, they're constantly changing. And if you ever read any like uh, dev blogs from video game developers, you'll see literally up until the last day, and sometimes after the last day, they'll still be working on it, and they'll just be pushing out patches. If you're ever like, damn, why does my game have a 50 gig patch on day one? Because they're still working on it. Uh, it gets even worse these days, because so many games are now called live games or games as a service. They've got lifespans of 10 years, or expected lifespans of 10 years. And because players expect constant new content, constant tweaks, constant updating, the games effectively never stop being developed. One so, of our takeaways sorry. is kind of that the way ECS works is a product of the way the games industry works, and that's kind of for better or for worse. Like, there's some terrible doctors of history who've researched medicines that have come about from terrible ways. And I'm not saying this is the case here, but ECS has kind of come out because the game development industry is very brutal to its workers in some ways. It kind of has a Hollywood model where it assembles a team and then it dissipates quickly and immediately. So lots of different people working on things very quickly and then changing, changing teams. And this kind of reflects that in some ways. So what this means is there's constant flux, unending flux. New things are being added, tweaked, and changed the whole time, which is how you can end up with ice spiders squeezing through doors like vermin. Uh, this is a, one of my favorite Twitter accounts. It's called The Strange Log. It tweets out of context patch notes from video games. Uh, so you get all sorts of um, amazing sort of things coming out there, like, uh, for example, warm laundry should no longer kill your sims. That probably, I'm totally guessing here, The Sims is a well-built game, but I'm willing to bet someone probably set a flag saying, Warm laundry is hot, sims die from hot. I reckon that's probably what happened. Total guess, I could be completely wrong there. Um, so effectively, what I'm getting at is games have a lot of moving parts. I know I keep saying that a lot, but you've got this swirling void of effectively unique things. Gameplay elements are being created, used, then torn down constantly, which means each frame, you don't actually know what's gonna happen. Like, you know there's some things that might happen, but you don't actually know what's gonna happen. Despite all that, there's actually a bunch of common aspects that most entities will have. So most will have position, visuals, animation, sound, gameplay data. They may not have them, but there's a lot of stuff already done. So you'll think, hang on, I don't want to re rewrite all this stuff that's, you know, a tree needs to have position as equally as a person does. I shouldn't have to rewrite that. Um, so we don't want to go back to the old issues of this hierarchy, because we've already agreed that's bad. 
luckily for us, while a game seems like this, so while it feels like you, know, you press W or move the stick forward, the player walks forward one position, uh, and then you know, you've got a skeleton, and the skeleton casts a, a ray off to the player. Paris is now the player, apparently. And then you know, if they can see the player, the skeleton, I'm the skeleton, can see the player, I'll move in. If I'm in range, I'm going to swing my sword, hit him, hurt Paris. Sorry, Paris. Um, but what a game's actually doing is it's receiving user input, so you know, the W key's pressed. It's raycasting from the player to the enemy. It's then updating everyone's position at once. You know, why wouldn't you? Uh, you're then dealing damage if necessary. You're then updating the animation so the skeleton goes like, as opposed to that, it, it'd even be less than that. Uh, you then render out the frame so it actually gets displayed. So effectively behind the scenes, they're much more of a series of steps that you follow each and every frame. And the series doesn't change even if the data that they're being given does change. So ECS basically takes the approach that we may as well stick to this model. The data is separate from the functionality, so we may as well just roll with it. Why obscure this? Why, why, why not stick to the data structures that we've been given? Uh, so while each entity in a game does have its own existence, they all boil down to effectively a process that they follow. And ECS basically structures your code to follow this process. So back in the distant past, when we did distant past, like the early 2000s. Or last week. You know. Or last week, I do it all the time. Uh, when we used OO in games, uh, each game was effectively some sort of object uh, superclass, generally called game object. We're very original in our naming. Uh, and naturally, it followed there was an instantiation, which enabled you know, extension of entities, blah, 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 blah. And we got more and more rigid hierarchies, which, so even though we were trying to do the right thing, we decided, no, we've got to go back. We have to smash these hierarchies apart which is where ECS sort of comes in. So again, we might go back to the simple class hierarchy example, except solutions to this are varied. I'm sure that everyone has come up with their own approach that was born out of the rage induced by a bad hierarchy. But the specific vein that spawned ECS and approaches like it is the concept that instead of a behavior inheriting its attributes and behaviors, adding or overriding some as needed, each instead is composed of attributes and behaviors relevant to it from a range of reusable ones. There's no hierarchy at all. The architecture is completely flat. Uh, so an entity is instead an aggregation, well, a composition of components. And doing this this way has a, a range of benefits, primarily that it's easy to define or change the behaviors of entities during development, but also that while the game is running, it's especially performant when it comes to creating, changing, and destroying large numbers of independent things, entities on the fly. So taking our earlier example, this is how it might look instead. And instead of worrying about where the third enemy will go, we just define a sword component and a shield component and give each to whoever needs it. So let's take a quick look again at each of the parts of ECS uh, through the lens of games in a slightly more detailed fashion and how it might work with a more modern video game. So in a game, an entity, entity is something that has a presence in your game world. That doesn't actually mean it has to be visible. It could be the camera. It could be the player object, which is visible. It could be a rock, which is visible. It could also be like a weather effect. It could be anything, literally anything. It's just an ID, really. It's nothing more than an ID to which components that belong to it say, hi, I am also associated with this ID. Uh, it, in a game engine that implements ECS, the components that make uh, up an entity will be tagged, typically, with the ID of the entity to which they belong to. Uh, so the entity implicitly aggregates the components tagged with the ID. Uh, in practice, that means a bunch of things. Probably the most interesting one is that you can dynamically add components to an entity uh, or dynamically remove them. And as Tim kind of alluded to with his example, if you wanted to, say, cast a spell on something that was moving in a fantasy video game, uh, you might cast the freeze spell, and then the freeze spell might just remove the velocity component from the object that was meant to be frozen. Now it's frozen without you really having to do any sort of complicated freezing behavior. There was a great example, actually, just recently of a video game where it was like, fan a lot of games are fantasy based, I don't know why. Uh, it had like all these minions running forward and arrows were shooting them, and you could also fire a fireball at the enemy and it would hit the enemy and it would throw them up in the air. And the way they actually did the throwing them up in the air was they just gave them an arrow component and took away their walking component, then suddenly they start flying like an arrow. And that was how they did it. Didn't have to write any extra code. They just moved which way it was facing. And this kind of systems thinking legitimately unlocks new game design potential in games, because it unlocks stuff that people didn't even think of before. All sorts of emergent behaviors become possible. So these are typical examples of an entity you might find in a video game. You know, pretty simple stuff. A component doesn't really differ too much in a video game context as compared to non-video games. Uh, a component is just something to store data. 
It doesn't act upon its data, it just stores it. It's kind of like a struct in programming terms. It might even be implemented as a struct. Um, in a real world video game implementation of ECS, where you'll typically find ECS implemented on top of some sort of object system, you might actually find that each component derives from some kind of abstract component type, which provides the ability to get the component's type uh, and the entity that contains it while the program is running and stuff like that. But it's really just a, a holder for something. Um, it has some data that is needed to support a feature or a behavior of something. Uh, and as we said earlier with the flags, an empty component might just be used to say it is something. So like player might be a component to tag the player object amongst a bunch of otherwise pretty similar humanoid-ish rigs in a video game. These are some typical components in a video game. Positions, velocities, reference to the sprite files that belong to the player or the object in question, health values, character names, a tag to say it's the player object. You could probably predict most of these. So what's a system do? You're destroying the stage, Tim. Maybe. Mm, yeah. Sorry. Uh, what's a system do? The system is the game logic. So a system operates on related group of components. System examples in a video game might be player control, rendering, gravity, movement, AI control, or much more small, specific things like freeze spell or things like that. It's pretty straightforward once you start thinking of them. ECS is massive in games, and games are massively into ECS right now. Um, as you may or may not be aware, the games industry is effectively at this point dominated by a mere handful of engine middleware providers. Uh, Unity and Unreal are two of the biggest ones. Uh, both have always been kind of pseudo-entity component based uh, in that they've recommended composing your work out of pieces, components for years and years. That's traditionally set on top of a fairly comprehensive object model. Uh, in the case of Unity, everything in Unity is a game object, which is descending from a mono behavior because it's C-sharp and so on and so on. Uh, Unity is slowly migrating their entire recommended stack to an actual legitimate ECS system, which currently interacts with the traditional model, but is theoretically going to phase it out slowly over time. Uh, Unity really encourages people to use their new system as it's a pure data-oriented approach. So probably the reason they're doing this is because it's fast. It's very fast on small, relatively embedded devices like phones and tiny things. And you can make a real tiny slice of a game just by shipping the entities that you need with the components that you need. So you know, ads that are games and all sorts of horrors like that can be made now. Um, Object-oriented based hierarchies are implicitly the past for video games, but probably never going to actually be the past. Um, They're always going to stick around a little bit. Nothing yeah. really ever goes away. Really the bit that video games are going to latch onto big time is that entities are your game objects, which are implicitly defined by collections of components. The components are data and are operated on by systems. So if you think about this, ECS usually does not actually mean less code. It probably means more code, actually. Uh, it probably means better code, but more of it, because it makes your code simpler to read and more discrete. So now let's have a look at some more concrete things that ECS could be good for outside of games. Uh, many sell ECS on its performance potential alone. We don't quite buy this as the only strength of ECS as some do, but it is nice. Um, so here's a great quote. I'm not going to read it out because you all can read, and if you can't read, uh, hopefully it will uh, be transcribed to you at some point. Um, but this is from Mike Acton, who is a uh, very prolific game developer. Uh, he's worked on a whole bunch of really big games, primarily in the engine development side of things. He's a big believer in this sort of philosophy, in that realistically all a program is is something that takes in data, spits out data. Um, and this sort of boils down into this concept called data-oriented design, or DOD. Is anyone here using data-oriented design out of curiosity? No, it is a little bit weird. Um, it's, yeah, so it's, the implementation specifics vary quite a lot depending on what you're going to do. So while you can talk about the brief principles of it, you can't really say, here's how you do it. Or at least, I don't think so. And data-oriented design, and ECS specifically, takes a view that you're never really doing just one thing. You're always doing lots and lots of things. So if we assume this to be true, then operating on a single item at one time can't be the best thing to do, because it's all about the cache. Um, so let's say here's our cache, uh, which from memory is 64 bytes on x86. I'm going from memory there. Doesn't matter. Here's our cache, lovely cache in the CPU just sitting there. Let's say we want to update the position of uh, our game entities, because we do many things at once. That's the principle of data-oriented design. We're going to update all of our positions at once. So we'll start with the player. Why not? 
So we grab the player, and let's say we've got, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be an object, but let's say we've got a traditional built-up sort of thing. So we've got a player here. It has a name, a position, a rotation, a mesh that helps you draw it, and some other stuff. Straight into the cache. You know, good job, Ram. You did your job. Cache has got it from here. CPU goes, hey, cache, need that position. Cache goes, don't worry, boss. Pass it over. Apparently, in my head, all CPU components are alive. Whatever. It moves the position, puts it back. We're all good. Now the CPU goes, hey, I need the, uh, the position for the, for the skeleton. And the cache goes, oh, never mind. I'll throw away the, the, the player. I'll grab in the, the, uh, the enemy here. Uh, and you know, now we've got its name, its position, its rotation, its mesh, its other stuff. And then you know, it goes, hey, can I have that? Yeah, here you go, sure, no worries, it handles it all. Everything's good. Uh, so we've got a cache miss. Uh, so this is from Chandler Carruth's Efficiency with Algorithms, Performance with Data Structures from C++ Con 2014. A great conference if you like C++. I find C++ terrifying, which is why I also love the conference. Uh, and he's got some hierarchical speeds there. So you can see very quickly this stuff's really bad. Basically, cache misses suck. Uh, this is true not just for games. This is true for everything. But remember, in a game, you got 16.6666 milliseconds. So a cache miss is you know, proportionally nastier. So there's a great description I once heard of a cache miss. So reading from the cache into the CPU is like the CPU taking a yawn. So you know, that's pretty quick. Reading from the RAM into the cache is basically the CPU taking a long weekend. And you know, your CPU, you paid a lot of money for it, you don't want it taking long weekends. So at the, the simplest way of sort of getting around this is you replace, instead of having position, rotation, et cetera, all put into the individual component, the individual entity itself, you make a transform. It'll be an array of positions and rotations, and there might be some other stuff. So then when the CPU goes, hey, I want to update the player, yep, here you go. Oh, I want to update the, uh, the enemy. Yep, here you go. Oh, I want to upda update the next thing. Oh, yep, here you go. Uh, so basically, the cache can uh, be filled as efficiently as possible is the idea. Now, it does depend a lot on what your data is as to how you do that. So that's why I'm kind of keeping it vague, because you need to know specifically what your data is and how big your cache is and so on and so forth. So data-oriented design basically is programming for good memory access is at its core what it's about. And ECS encourages data-oriented design. You don't technically have to do it, but you'll end up creating something which is like you're doing bad data-oriented design anyway, so you may as well just do good data-oriented design and wrap your ECS around it. Um, so yeah, one of the, probably one of the biggest reasons that ECS has taken off in games is because it, if you do it properly, you get all these nice performance advantages. But that's not technically ECS doing that in my mind. With ECS's focus on optimal layout and minimal transformation of data in memory, parallelization becomes theoretically trivial. Each system should be able to operate in isolation. They can be distributed among different threads and maximize the throughput of the systems. Uh, from a data perspective, ECS is a great fit if you're working on a project that needs to perform a large number of relatively similar but not identical tasks on a large data set. So if you structure your program around consuming the data as a stream, then ECS's assumption that the data set is non-homogeneous means different systems consu consume their own different segments of the same large set of data, assuming that they have not very many mutations, they won't clash with each other. They're leaving each other alone. This means that you can make complex interlocking systems like air traffic control, uh, which is all about rapid processing of data, all from many, many different sources where far more analysis occurs than mutation. So in Australia, something that looks a lot like ECS is actually part of our air traffic control systems. Uh, we think that lightweight composability is the biggest advantage of ECS. It makes it easy to compose a new type of entity just by glomming components together. So instead of managing a growing hierarchy of relationships where develop, uh, development then come, becomes about creating useful and reusable components in abstraction, even though we just heard Rommel trash reusability. Yeah, what would he know? <laughs> uh, so this is key in systems <laughs> whose... As in, is he here? Oh, there. hi, Rommel. <laughs> If you like, we can bag out Rommel for the last 10 minutes, it's fine. We'll trash Rommel trashing reusability. <laughs> yeah. uh, but this is key in systems whose data is varied in type and source and has the need to process, be processed in many places as quickly as possible. And from a team perspective, as we said before, this can allow for entities to be designed by parties that need not understand how their corresponding components or systems will work on the logic side. Uh, more specifically, we think there are some key domains where 
this could be great. Uh, and to take the first example, GUI programming is an application where parts of the whole may have complex relationships across proximity, structure, and semantics, but may require many of the same behaviors, such as the ability to draw onto the screen, hold state, or refresh. Uh, <laughs> because in theory, components and systems are separate from how they're used. Different people can build different bits of your system. Different teams can build different bits of your system. And everything should still, in theory, work. Uh, in practice, it's not that easy, but it's a nice thought. Truthfully, it's probably more that it, the video game has a video game industry as a transitive workforce. Uh, uh, it necessitates these kinds of very discreetly segmented practices and architectures that support that locality of reasoning and all that. So, if your data and procedures remain uniform, then ECS is probably not good for you. You probably actually just need a database uh, or something else entirely. Databases are great. Databases are still great, and we really like if ECS doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. Uh, ECS is obviously not very good for anything that's disk heavy. Games are not particularly disk heavy. They kind of load a bunch of stuff at the beginning and they don't really touch the disk again traditionally. Uh, ECS is not great for unchanging data and procedures. So if you have the same, you know, it's, it obviously doesn't make sense. Or heavily hierarchical data. Again, you might want a database or something that's actually designed to store something with a hierarchy. Uh, so we've been talking a lot about these. How would you actually go about making one of these? Because I'm a big believer in, in seeing code because, you know, my upbringing is a programmer. Uh, so we're going to do it the quick and dirty way. We're going to make a game about evil skeletons, you know, trying to stab us. We're not going to actually make the whole game. We're just going to do it in an imaginary pseudo language called Tim Code, which I made up. It looks a lot like every other language that I've ever worked on. Weird. Uh, so let's start with our entities, because we all love things. Who doesn't love things? So here's our entities. We're done. Sweet. Entities complete. Uh, this is actually a little bit silly. Normally, you'd give them some additional metadata, such as a name or so on and so forth, just simply so like your, your human flesh brain can as opposed to your non-flesh brain, uh, can handle all this stuff. We uh, so we've got you know, player, skeletons, cameras, etc. We're going to need components, because who doesn't love abilities? Uh, so here are our components. We've got transforms, we've got movement, we've got health, shield, etc. We've also got two that are just flags. So we've got player and camera. So they have no data. They just say you now do a thing. So how do we connect these together? Well, we'd have our game object. Uh, it may not necessarily be an object. Uh, and, you know, here's our entities from before. Here's all of our components. Normally, you would have some sort of component manager. That way, you don't actually have to have a big, long list of these things yourself. But we're doing it the quick and dirty way. And all of these are the exact same length. That way, we can just use the values of entities as our keys into the components. How do we add them in? Like that. Easy. Done. Again, normally, you wouldn't do this purely in code. You would have some sort of manager where you go like, hey, add a health component to entity 0, add a movement component to entity 2, so on and so forth. But the idea is the same regardless of how you actually do it. You're just adding elements to an array. So what about the systems? There we go, magic. Uh, so this is our update frame method. I apologize if it's a little bit hard to read. Basically, this gets called every single frame of the game. So roughly every 16 milliseconds. It gets told the time difference between the frames, because no game is perfectly running at 60 locked. So you know, we'll get our input. We'll then use a system called update player speed. It takes in the input, all the players, makes any modifications necessary. Then we'll move everything that can be moved. So that's all of our, we'll need our movers, of which our player is one and our skeleton is one. We'll need our uh, transforms, so we get the X, Y, Z, et cetera. Z, sorry. Uh, sorry, I speak Australian. It's like American, but with more English. Um, and delta times, so that way we can actually you know, move between them. And you know, deal damage, reduce damage, and then finally we render the frame. So there is actually a hierarchy here, a, stead, a set of processes. What would one of our, uh, our uh, systems actually look like? It would look something like this. You know, we just go through all of them. We, make the, uh, we just update the, move, uh, the position value based on their move velocity. Pretty simple stuff. So while we, us human creature things, think of our entities like this, the game thinks of them like this. Uh, so we've got all these arrays. Now, there's better ways of doing this. This is the quick and dirty way. Because uh, it's something you can actually set up yourself in like a weekend of fiddling around. All you need is some sort of UI uh, system to draw the elements now. Uh, and it actually works better than you might think. It just doesn't scale that well. Because suddenly you're going to find yourself with arrays that are like 10 million elements long, most of which are null. So there are obviously better ways. And I'm sure you can all think of better ways using maps and so on and so forth. But it's the best way to get started because it's super easy to understand. And who doesn't love arrays? I love arrays. So. That's a very quick and dirty implementation. If you want to get experimenting with ECS straight away, 
And a really good way of doing this, we recommend, is with like a side project, a very small thing you might work on in your spare time, some sort of side hustle, some sort of hobby project. Don't necessarily bring this to work and say, let's make this ECS. Um, there's a lot of great ECS implementations. There's one for pretty much every language under the sun. Uh, Entity, NTT, is a particular interesting one. It's a key component of the remake of Minecraft Microsoft made a couple of years ago, like the, the high performance one. Uh, and Entitas is a really interesting one to look at, which is the C-sharp one there. Entitas is huge and massive, but is available in pretty much every language. Uh, none of this is new. In fact, you're probably doing this sort of thing already in many ways. If, uh, out of curiosity, you're thinking, this sounds like an SQL database in memory. You're right. It kind of is. Yep. So, uh, yeah, don't, don't worry if you're just trying to figure out what's going on. And you can't see how and why this would be a system of its own. It's a whole bunch of names for something that exists all over the place. So we've given you a quick tour of ECS and how it's just a newish kind of data-oriented design. We've discussed how ECS is an architecture made up of entities, which are just an ID and components which hold the raw data for the system, uh, for an aspect, and systems which operate on these things. Uh, so ECS encourages a highly composable design. In fact, that's its main takeaway. If you're going to take anything, throw away your hierarchies. No hierarchies, all composition. At its core, it looks like just the composition you've been using, but it's like composition on steroids in that you don't have hierarchy at all. The human mind will put the hierarchy and structure back in. That's fine. The game doesn't need to care about that. ECS is, in that respect, a very data-oriented design paradigm. It has a bunch of strengths. It's hopefully performant. It's hopefully flexible. And it hasn't got a hierarchy, which is a misspelling of hierarchy, to remember. Uh, it kind of has many of the advantages of microservices or functional programming. So don't be alarmed if you're thinking that. You're correct. It's not either of those things, but it kind of resembles them if you squint. Uh, so it's easy to pick up, edit, test, refactor, and so on. Uh, it has a bunch of weaknesses. Weirdly enough, there is no clear starting point. Is maybe a strength, as games also have no clear starting point. But at least with ECS, you can pick up a system or pick at a system and go with that. But there's a lot of code in ECS implementations. To sum up, there's a lot of choice in ECS systems, but there's a lot of ideas within ECS. You can pick and choose the bits you like. There's no one right way of doing this. Uh, hopefully, it helps you think about your systems in a different way, though. So hopefully, we've helped in that respect. Uh, we're going to put slides on the SACon website later, and we'll put resources at this URL, which I think is actually just the talk on the SACon website. But if you want to take a photo of it anyway, you're welcome to. Please uh, review us. It's in the app and the website. Please give us a comment if you review us. It's really even if you hate it, tell it's us. It's really why. stressful to stare at the review list and go like, "Why did they give us three stars? Let what does not. that mean?" So if you've got time to review us, we really appreciate a comment. It really helps everyone here. So review all the talks. Uh, one star ah. for each of us. That makes sense. Yeah. But you need to put that. That's, yeah. You'll need to put that in the comment, though. Make Otherwise it two won't... stars for each of us. So yeah, please follow us or talk, talk to us online. Uh, we have a Meet the Experts. We're theoretically experts, which seems weird, but we're not sure what's going on. Uh, we're at one of the tables over on the side of the sponsor building at 305 today. We have some ECS systems on our computers. We can show you if you'd like to see these things in action. Uh, or you just want to complain or talk literally about anything. Uh, thank you. Yep, that's cool. Bring it on. Yeah, I can do it. Uh, so we've got about five minutes, in theory. Seven minutes, apparently, yes, according to the clock. Hi. Hello. Um, so do you think that uh, in Unity, the fact that um, Unity is uh, somehow built up upon Mono and uh, that hierarchical structure that you were talking about earlier uh, resembles the fact that C Sharp is somehow an uh, object-oriented uh, language and uh, it is built upon hierarchy? Um, and if so, sorry. do you think that uh, C Sharp is suited for uh, ECS strategy? OK, um, so the, if I'm understanding your question correctly, you're basically asking, because it's still kind of implemented semi-hierarchical in things like Unity, is that a side effect of like C Sharp? No. Um, so it's implemented in a semi-hierarchical fashion, fashion in Unity, because Unity's scene editor, the thing where you actually you know, make the, the games in, is naturally hierarchical. The ECS system actually runs like as a completely separate like mini process inside the whole game that does do it fully ECS the proper way. It's just in the UI what you're seeing is them then magically squishing it into the hierarchy. So the actual ECS system is separate from the hierarchy. It's just they show it hierarchical because Unity's how old's Unity now? 15 years old. They don't just want to throw away 15 years of people's experience. So the system is still 
you know, properly traditionally ECS, it's just, it's kind of obscured a little bit. Oof. I'm not Unity. I, I, the question is, would Unity move away from Mono? I doubt it. I honestly don't know. I'm not Unity, though, so. Oh, okay, no, according to Paris. I would doubt it. They've spent a long, they know Mono pretty well. I'd be surprised if they left it. Hi. Hi. Um, a lot of the concepts kind of that you guys presented, uh, it sounds a lot like, like the functional paradigm, right? Like yep. separating code and data. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very interesting because that's like exactly what you don't think about when you think of games. Yep. Obviously, it's you know, kind of more performance oriented. And yeah, so like, it, is that an intentional thing or have they kind of independently discovered these things? Um, so, like, I'm not one of the inventors of ECS, uh, and it sort of grew up over 20 or 30 years of game discipline, so I can't quite say. I think deep down inside, every programmer wants to do things functionally. It's just practically a lot of things are hard to do functionally. Uh, so I think when given the choice to do something functionally, I think they took it. Um, I don't think it was an intentional design decision. I think it sort of grew out of the needs. W one real huge advantage of ECS that we sort of mentioned is that People who aren't programmers at all, people who have no technical skills whatsoever beyond the ability to use computers, can just be told, hey, just add the flying component. And then they can build games out of that. They just click a button in an editor and suddenly they have it. And that, I think, was probably the bigger drive. The fact that the way they had to invent that naturally boiled down into functional is, I think, a, a happy coincidence for the, for the programmers. I, I don't fully know, but I would say, I think it's a coincidence, but a good one. Hmm? To go on Tim's comment about how, is this like <laughs> microservices? Uh, and we go, yes, kind of. It's as much like microservices as it is like functional pro programming, and as much fu functional programming is like microservices, in that when you boil down to the extreme end of performance being really important, so like edge devices, really low powered devices, games, anything to the extreme end of performance, they all end up going back to that kind of, we need to parallelize everything, so we need to make everything as non-mutable, non-clashable as possible, so that they just kind of end up there. That was fun. I'm gonna follow up on that, because the functional programming thing was in my mind, too. So, uh, and I actually tweeted you, and you didn't uh, respond. So I realized, I left my phone over there. I just, so my watch kept going off, and I'm like, oh yeah, my phone's over there. We have a station there, like, we don't have an adapter for your laptop, so you have to use the other laptop that's dying, and also we've got one mic. So yeah, we're good. <laughs> I just never tweeted anybody during their talk before, and I was really excited about the idea. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> we usually all have these, and we dance around. <laughs> Anyways, what I tweeted, yep. or related to what I tweeted, was you said composition. Mm -hmm. So that to me means like math. The re result of this function is fed into that function, is fed into that function, is fed into that function. There are chains, that's the, and that's functional programming. I don't see any chains in ECS. Is um, that just because you gave us really easy things? I, or? The, the, like when you had the, the slide with all the different how, how the computer sees it, and it was like these are the transforms and these are the movers and everything, and that is, uh, that's where you get back to the, uh, it's your systems run in a predefined order, and you define what the chain of systems executed on each frame are. So in our game example, it's like, well, you obviously have to see what moves before you see what hits each other, before you see what damage is done, and so there, in that way, they operate on that data and then they put it back. And then the next one takes the same data. And in that way, it's like they're feeding it to the next one. They just put it back in the bucket first. Um, one of the real problems with, that's why we did a quick and dirty way of showing it, because I wanted to show an actual ECS implementation, but they're generally highly optimized, which means the code is hard to read, so. Obfuscated code. Well, not obfuscated, <laughs> just it's, you can't just pick it up, you know. So Unity's implementation of ECS actually then bolts all of the, the true ECS stuff back onto Unity's editor, which then visualizes it as if it's objects, because otherwise a human trying to build a game in the editor environment is completely incomprehensible. So Unity's kind of mapped it both, both directions in either way, so the human can interact with it and the computer can interact with it. I think we're out of, we got one minute. One minute. Or not. One question, yeah. I want to know what game that guy made. <laughs> It was a good one. He's like, you idiots, you spelled it all wrong. <laughs> so I can imagine that you have maybe hundreds of entities and components, right? How do you sort of manage that without introducing hierarchy or domains? Like, do you have domains for each of these pieces? Like, how does a developer know that um, this piece exists? Like, I don't want to build the same thing that someone else built. 
Um, oh. So uh, most entity component systems that implement this sort of thing have a grouping called a feature, which lets you... So the feature then lets you bundle common bits together in like sensible ways, and it's still not necessarily an object. It's often like a tag on the objects, it's, on the components. Um, or it's often entity. generally just a UI thing. So it goes yeah. like, hey, look, here's the here's the the collection of these things together. A, a thing that really um, helped me get get to grips with how this is, could be structured in a very large project is to read the Entitas documentation, which is one of those entity component systems, and they have a very clear feature implementation, which is documented really well and kind of explains how the concept could work. Ah, uh, and unfortunately we're out of time. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.